Hello, everyone. Um, just want to let everyone know that ASL will be provided and captioning is also provided for today's webinar. You are able to uh, pin the ASL interpreter. I want to say a big thank you to Inclusive Communication Services for providing us with American Sign Language today and for Joe Gale for volunteering her time to caption for us. Um, questions will be taken via the Q&A box and will be answered as we go. In addition, we hope uh, that we have time at the end for some questions. I want to welcome Dawn to get us started. Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today on this auspicious event. Um, I am Dawn Skaggs, and I'm the Chief Program Officer at the World Institute on Disability. And we are a founding organization and a steering team committee member for GADRA. Um, our host today, at, GADRA is the host today, to celebrate International Women's Day 2024. In their campaign this year, it is to inspire inclusion and emphasize the importance of diversity and empowerment in all aspects of society. This year's campaign theme really underscores the crucial role of inclusion in achieving gender equality. And it calls for the action to break down barriers, challenges, and stereotypes, and create environments where women, all women, are valued and respected. And that really aligns with everything we do and our partners do, and I think most of your organizations do, if not all. Um, we want to recognize the unique perspectives and contributions of women from all walks of life. And for the next hour, we're going to be featuring women who are inspiring inclusion with disabilities in disasters. And so I want to uh, turn it over and not spend any of your time, but turn it over to Sherry, who will share with you each of our our partners today, who are women who will be speaking about their experience in inclusive disaster um, strategies and how they support and what they feel is an inspiring thought um, as we look to women internationally to lead the way, and particularly women with disabilities leading the way in disaster response and recovery. And Sherry. Thank you, Dawn, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, just uh, really quickly, I do also want to thank again um, Inter Inclusive Communication Services for the interpreting that they're providing in American Sign Language, and also Joe Gale for doing our captioning for us today. Thank you so much. And I'm going to briefly um, introduce our panelists and then when they speak they can give you additional information about themselves. I'm so excited to be um, moderating this panel today and thank you all for participating. So first we have um, Professor Dr. Nazan Koloman. She's Chair of Science and Project Department of Bayaze, which is a disability-led organization and she's also Chair of the Animal Science Department at Kukurova University in Turkey. She's been instrumental in GADRA's Operation Mission Stuffed Containers project, um, where we shipped a lot of durable medical equipment and consumable medical supplies and other items to Turkey after the earthquake there last year in February. Um, next we have Vishila James, a GADRA partner who is uh, located in Switzerland and she's been assisting us in acquiring resources throughout Europe. We have Yulia Sachuk, founder of Fight for Right Ukraine, who responded to the needs of people with disabilities after the Russian invasion two years ago. And Yulia also serves on the board of the World Institute on Disability. We have Pamela Molina. She's the executive director of the World Federation of the Deaf, an organization with global reach, which is now partnering with GADRA. Katya Dartiges, I hope I pronounced that right, Katya. Please forgive me if I didn't. Um, she is the lead from a disability-led organization responding to people with disabilities who were impacted by Hurricane Otis uh, in the Guerrero region of Mexico earlier this year. 
And finally, we have Cecilia Kasanga, who is uh, in, an intern with the World Institute on Disability. She's working with Gadra, currently attending Tel Aviv University in Israel, working on her master's in disaster management. And now I will turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Nazan Koloman. Uh, can you switch on my camera, please? Uh, hello. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Nazan Kolma. Uh, as uh, Don uh, introduced me. Uh, I am head of uh, Science and Project Committee of uh, Beyazay Association and also chair of Animal Science Department in uh, Chukurova uh, University. Uh, as everybody knows, we had very uh, terrible uh, earthquake, twin earthquake. Uh, we lost a lot of people and still uh, we are looking for more than 100,000 people in Turkey. Uh, it was really bad days and uh, still we try to recover. <clears throat> uh, as a woman uh, working advocate for support the rights of people with disabilities and disasters is often challenging yet in uh, incredibly meaningful experience. Uh, I I live in Adana, as I told before, which was affected by earthquake and along with uh, 11 other provinces. Uh, initially, uh, before we panicked and thinking it was only happening uh, to us, uh, it was a rainy and cold night uh, and we heard cries for help, but the power was out and uh, it was dark and we couldn't see anything uh, using our cell phones. And we realized that within an hour that uh, the earthquake had affected a much larger, larger area than we initially thought. And we immediately uh, joined uh, the relief uh, efforts. And we couldn't perform search and rescue operations because uh, it required a regular team uh, experience and equipment uh, to help the people. And naturally, we organized ourselves to help both those affected by, uh, by the earthquake and people with disabilities. Uh, during this time, it was very difficult to provide accessibility to special needs of disabled individuals. Everyone who survived uh, was trying to help to, with the organizations, and we didn't have luxury to make gender uh, distinctions. Uh, then we uh, were prior, uh, priorities uh, by male victims uh, in meeting our needs first together with disabled people, uh, particularly women, children, uh, disabled people were uh, given pri priority uh, to in terms of shelter, water, food, and uh, heating, uh, blanket, uh, etc. Uh, women, uh, during this period, women uh, take on more effective roles than men, particularly in uh, facilitating access to the resource, uh, emotionally empowering uh, other people because all we are uh, mother uh, and people with disabilities and children, uh, fostering solitary, preventing chaos, and especially in rehabilitation stage of children who lost their parents during the, uh, this catastrophe. Uh, before uh, disasters or crises occur, there are several proactive steps individuals can take to uh, advocate for the women, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, during the, this uh, situation, uh, staying calm and getting organized is really difficult because you always heard some, somebody die and you lost some uh, relatives, your friends, your home, everything is chaotic. Uh, but um, before this kind of things, uh, we should raising awareness uh, for this, educate yourself and others about specific needs uh, of women, 
people with disabilities in emergencies through the workshops and seminars. Learn best practice for supporting various population groups during emergencies. Uh, listen to the voices and understand the experiences of these people, disaster affected uh, communities. Elevate their voices in decision making process and advocate for their meaningful part, uh, participation in all stages of disaster management. And also uh, strengthen uh, advocacy efforts by, uh, by collaborating uh, with women's rights organizations and disability rights organizations. Promote the inclusion of uh, women uh, and uh, people with disabilities in disaster risk, uh, risk uh, reduction. Uh, the theme of this year, International Women Days, has been uh, des designed as inspiring inclusion. And uh, this theme uh, serve as a poignant reminder of efforts to uh, efforts to uh, promote inclusivity, diversity, and equality for all individuals, regardless of gender, ethnicity, ability, or background. And also recognizing the intersectionality uh, of uh, identities and experiences and the applications uh, and representations of all voices, thus ensuring equal participation in decision-making processes and policies. Uh, in conclusion, the theme of inspiring inclusion underscores the importance of celebrating achievements Acknowledging, acknowledging challenges and uh, continue to work toward less, uh, towards uh, a more inclusive and equitable world for all individuals. Uh, I can empathize because uh, I, along with my family and, uh, uh, and friends, have been affected by an earthquake. We lost uh, a lot of relatives and I deeply felt the possibility of not being able to wake up in the morning from the Saturday bed where I slept Sunday at night or possibility of being trapped under the rubble of four days and the realization that I could become disabled in the, an accident or disaster. I feel like I need to work more for this disadvantage uh, as the, if I uh, experience each of the situations uh, myself. Uh, for the woman watching, watching today, I want to offer words of inspiration. You are capable, resilient, and powerful beyond measure. And remember that you are not alone on your journey. And um, I would like to thank to Gadra uh, for their participation in our project and uh, for their great efforts uh, for my people and excellent uh, project we had together. And uh, believe in yourself, it is my last words, believe in yourself, trust your instincts, and never underestimate the impact of your actions. You have the strength to overcome obstacles, the courage to speak your truth, and the ability to make a difference. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and happy Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time and your words. Thank you so much. And now I will go to Vishala James um, so that we can hear from you. I can hear an echo. Is it okay? Okay, great. So first of all, I'm um, very grateful to be included in this uh, amongst these esteemed group of ladies. And um, I'm just gonna speak a little bit about myself and uh, probably share a few thoughts. Um, first to start with, as was mentioned earlier, I'm based in Switzerland. Uh, my name is Bishala James. I'm a retired corporate executive, having had 35 years in the corporate world in very large companies that I was lucky enough to work in, companies like Packaged Goods, Procter & Gamble, 
toys, Hasbro, as well as agriculture, Syngenta. My expertise at that time was really about building new business opportunities and making them happen. So no matter what the problem, finding a way to get around and motivate others to be able to deliver. And that was what I basically did in my corporate world and corporate life. My husband and I both had a corporate career and we were lucky enough to be in the United Kingdom, US, and then in Europe. And, um, and then lastly, to say just a bit about myself is we kind of embody the international family. I'm originally from Malaysia. My husband is from Wales. My mother who lives with us is from Sri Lanka. And our two wonderful daughters were born in the US. So we kind of are a microcosm, if you like, <laughs> uh, of the United Nations. As I consider what I would like to share, there were three things that came to mind. Um, one is in keeping with the theme of inspiring inclusion, what inspires me? Very interesting question. And I, for me personally, it is all those who overcome unspeakable and uh, unbelievable traumas and disasters and who not only survive, but thrive because of them and find a way to live life to the fullest. And that's what really inspires me. And when I think about who um, is closest to me that does that, uh, it was actually my family. So my husband, Robert, uh, he had a spinal cord injury in 2018 and uh, has experienced an unbelievably amazing career uh, in the corporate world. And he was paralyzed from the chest down. So of course, overnight our lives changed, but he fights every single day. He tries his best. He's learned how to use his new body. He's always optimistic. He never gives up. So you can see, you know, with him in our household, uh, it's very hard to get down on ourselves when we have some smaller thing going on that we're finding difficult. I would have to say the other would be um, our two amazing daughters. They inspire me. They're in their 30s and uh, they have been unwavering in their support to us before the accident, especially during the accident and now after. Um, and the last two individuals would be my mum. Uh, she's been living with us for over 20 years. She was unflailing in her support when Rob had his accident. And of course, my mother-in-law, Margaret, who has an incredible love for life and uh, really shows us the way despite um, becoming deaf in her 40s, um, surviving breast cancer and now tackling dementia. So everything is very close to home. Um, if I think about what was the key experience that sort of influenced my current work, I did use the word retired because I have retired from the corporate world. And I chose to do that when Rob had his accident. Um, you know, we completely reframed our lives and we've chosen to really focus on enjoying every day that comes, as well as trying to give back where we can. And so I took early retirement and shifted into trying to find different themes where I could tap into my corporate experience, um, which I already referenced. It is, you know, problems or challenges or opportunities where solutions are needed. And that kind of led me to the three key areas that I am currently focusing on. Number one, very close to my heart, uh, and that's all to do with caregiving. For those of us who suddenly find ourselves thrust into this role, um, you know, it's really important to build self-care, to find ways to support, but also find ways to help the person who we are caring for be as independent as possible. And that's a massive learning curve for me. 
So um, through our foundation, the Robert and Vishala James Foundation that we will set up this year, I hope to provide support and services and links as needed for those who provide care. I'm also a trustee of Carers UK, uh, and they provide care to those in the United Kingdom. Uh, so that's the whole theme of caregiving. And again, Rob's accident has shifted me in this direction. And the two other areas I focus on is to learn more about the space of spinal cord injury, because our situation is unique. We're older, our children are grown up. What about all those who have to face spinal cord injury when they're very early in their um, maturity, for example, either teenagers, youngsters, or just married or having families? So I'm board president of an organization called Backbones, uh, which is all about connecting those with spinal cord injury. Its founder, Rebecca Torres, is an ins inspiring Hispanic uh, lady uh, who herself had an accident when she was a teenager and is a quadriplegic. But I have tried to learn as well as give back in, in that scenario. And the last area that I focus on, of course, is supporting the amazing work that Gadra does in the area of disaster relief, because you know the thought that my husband would not have access to the support needed if there was a disaster or be considered equally is just, I, I can't even imagine it. So I'm proud and honored to be part of this amazing team. And if I may just give a shout out to two organizations who've been very helpful. One is Roll Aid in Switzerland. They're a nonprofit that refurbish wheelchairs, used wheelchairs for use and donations. And uh, the other is Sunrise Medical, uh, that is a wheelchair manufacturer based in Germany, who is continuing to explore ways to support all of Gadra's efforts. Um, the last thing I would like to leave with is, um, you know, what words of advice would I share? And of course, I can only share it from my personal perspective. I think four words come to mind. I will say a little bit about them. One is belief. The second is balance. The third, spark. Uh, and the fourth, empathy. So with belief, as mentioned uh, and, and said very eloquently by our first panelist, believe in yourself, you are strong. You have all the capabilities you need. You may need to find the quiet time to connect with them, but you are strong, have that confidence. The second on balance, make time for yourself. I touched on self-care. Self-care has been my oxygen to even make the time to connect with myself gives me energy to be able to do what I know I can do and gives me confidence. Um, the third was find your spark. Who inspires you? Why? Try and learn from that. The other could be what things do you do that really inspire you? And don't get down on yourself when, you know, the obstacles get in the way and it's really difficult. You know, take a breath and just ask, what am I to learn from this? And I think that just shifts the energy into a slightly more positive way. And then the final one that I will close with is empathy. Um, and I think uh, this quote from Maya Angelou, which is one of my favorites, uh, says it all. Um, and I quote her. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. So with that, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Vishala, for your words. And, and it's so great to have you as a partner with Godra. We appreciate you so much. Next, we will move on to Yulia Sachuk. Um, Yulia, if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about yourself and share your experiences. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, 
everyone. Uh, good evening in Ukraine and uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm Yulia Sichuk, I'm Ukrainian and uh, I'm a disability activist in Ukraine more than uh, for more than 15 years. And when the full-scale Russian war started in February 2022, with my team, a uh, team of organization of uh, people with disabilities led by women with disabilities fight for right, we started to do our emergency work thanks to uh, World Institute on Disabilities, a partnership for inclusive disaster strategies and many, many international and Ukrainian volunteers and partners. And um, we are doing this work uh, for all of this uh, 750 something with something days. Uh, we provide uh, the necessary support for Ukrainians with disabilities during the war uh, with different type of assistance uh, and support. In the beginning, the most needed were evacuations, medical evacuations, uh, temporary accommodations. Now we uh, in Ukraine, uh, people with disabilities uh, need a more sustainable support uh, or more urgent after the unexpected uh, bomb shell shelling. And um, today I want to cover some aspects regarding um gender perspective and how it is to do all this work and to live in ukraine and to survive during the war when you are you are a woman and have disability um now in our database uh we have more than 20 30 000 of requests for help and i think more than 80 percent uh, of them are from women different women who are asking support for themselves for their family members and children uh, elderly uh, parents and uh, from that we see that care and support now are provided in Ukraine mostly by women. Our community changed because of war and uh, women now doing all work regarding support people with disabilities um, in their communities and their families. And we at the same time don't see uh, that this is included in humanitarian responses from big international organizations or even our authorities. Till now, we even don't have, we don't know clear statistics and data uh, how many women with disabilities we have in Ukraine. And this is directly influenced the quality of policies and programs which we have for us, actually. And uh, regarding this aspect, uh, the next will be visibility. Uh, during the war, uh, we are seen by international and humanitarian actors mostly as an object for support, but we uh, can be also subjects. And uh, our experience, uh, again, together with GADRA support, we provided all support which is needed by our team in which more than 50% are women with disabilities. And for many of them, uh, their work now is the first place of work. For many of them, mm, this is the first uh, team work. And um, when we see how international, for example, organizations are coming in Ukraine and looking for disability, uh, disability, uh, staff uh, who will be doing disability work or work regarding gender equality. Uh, we don't see that, uh, again, women with disabilities are. One of the problem is, yes, uh, in Ukraine, we don't, may, not many people have sufficient education, but very often international um all these providers who have their representation representatives in ukraine uh don't have um enough information to provide uh appropriate support and response and 
uh, include needs of all um, people with disabilities, different groups of people with disabilities, again, women with disabilities, and uh, to understand what they are doing on the ground. Uh, since the first days of the war and till now, we don't have a specific uh, different services which are needed uh, regarding the intersectional representation of group women with disabilities. And uh, it's a big problem for many actors and uh, including UN cluster system and etc. But um, I think uh, it's really needed to be changed uh, because uh, now we have a situation when the most uh, people who the most mostly needed support uh, very often don't have access to it and don't receive it. Um, another mm, another question uh, is in general again uh, access to resources. When we are talking about response, uh, very mm, often it about to provide this support locally. And this is about localization of international ac uh, actions. And um, organizations of uh, women with disabilities uh, don't have enough capacity to uh, be active and to provide such support. Uh, and very often they are used by the big donors uh, for to receive statistics, to receive good stories, but not to have um, support for sustainable uh, growth and uh, again mm, sustainable <laughs> to be uh, sustainable uh, with what they are doing in their communities. Um, yes, I think that's all and uh, also at the same time uh, i want to share on, on this day uh, i'm now in lviv in the western part in ukraine we have uh, now with our organization great meeting of uh, women with disabilities throughout ukraine more than 30 of us uh, now here in uh, western part of ukraine in lviv and i see from our girls and women that they are ready also to participate in reconstruction. They are go. They really want to have inclusive and accessible reconstruction. And uh, I want to stress the issue that we should also remember that after uh, conflicts, after disasters, uh, it's really important to have women with disabilities voice. Uh, to guarantee reconstruction is inclusive and accessible for everyone. And um, yeah, so we are uh, keep going. Uh, we uh, hope uh, to have our victory in uh, nearest future and uh, happy International uh, Women's Rights Day. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. And so now we will move on to Pamela Molina. Uh, if you'd like to say a few words about yourself and the work that you're doing, we'd love to hear from you. All right, well, hello everyone. <clears throat> Happy Women's Day. This is so exciting to all be here with you. Okay, so I am Pamela. My sign name looks like this. I'm originally from um, Chile, signed like this. It's in South America. I later moved to America and have be, been re relocated and working here ever since. Um, I used to be in Bolivia, or I'm currently in Bolivia now, coming to you and talking to you from Bolivia, doing some work in this country. I'm working with various deaf women, indigenous individuals here. Starting um, tomorrow, we're going to be doing some get-togethers throughout the week 
um, so that we can um, really learn more about what this looks like. So I want to thank so much for Gadra for inviting us here, especially us as World Federation of the Deaf, um, to give a perspective on deaf women in where we stand in this um, in the in where we are in the world right now. So really thankful to be here and happy to be able to provide my thoughts and resources. There are more than 70 million deaf individuals in the world. Um, and we've got 106 national agencies that are run by deaf people within 136 different countries around the world. So that's kind of where we get the number of 70 million people, but at the same time, we really don't have the accurate data to explore or the information that we would be able to get the real numbers of those people. We're just relying on the various deaf organizations who are giving us the data that they have within their countries. Um, there is also variations in national sign languages. She's freezing a little bit. So we don't really know about how many deaf people are in the world or a lot about how what experiences look like across the globe. We haven't been able to collect the data or surveys that would give the accurate representation. There's also difficulties with deaf people participating in surveys like this and cultural barriers that need to be addressed for how those individuals can participate and data can be made quality. So what WFD is really attempting to do is include individuals, intersectional individuals from the deaf community, specifically women, as we talk about on this day, and also CRPD to make sure that we can get the data and information accurately and be able to provide resources for what deaf people need in the regions of the world, specifically if natural disasters hit those countries and those areas where deaf people are prominently living. As far as deaf women are concern concerned, um, we don't have a lot of information about the de uh, their, their experience. Um, there's a lot of different barriers that they face to participating in surveys and questions on where we could get that data. Um, disaster relief risks. Um, there's some data from 2022, DRR. I said we're going to DRR in 2022 um, with Ukraine when that war started. Ukraine deaf people were reaching out to WFD for assistance and they needed support. So what we did is try to rally, <clears throat> rally with the National Deaf Agency um, near, in nearby countries, such as Poland um, and other neighboring countries so that we could reach out to them and try to provide more accurate and sustainable support for deaf individuals who are fleeing Ukraine because of the Russian war. And because of that, we could offer support in neighboring countries, deaf people there, especially for women and children who are seeking refuge. Now, the difficult thing to judge is how many deaf people actually were able to escape on top of the fact that there are communication barriers where they provided food and shelter and lodging. Um, there were a number of people who willingly opened their homes for these individuals. And then um, that's kind of where the work with my work with DRR started. <clears throat> so we wanted to provide a budget um, and a campaign to really raise some money for help for people, for deaf women and children who are fleeing Ukraine. Um, 24 seven, we wanted to provide 24 seven support to those individuals with um, interpreting services so that they would have information about what's going on with the war. But unfortunately there were a lot of times deaf people didn't receive interpreters and that caused a lot of problems with access to the information. So the Ukraine president was really great about providing a lot of resources and trying to get accurate um, supplies to individuals and those then later fed down to the deaf community getting support that they needed. Secondly, women, um, deaf women, who are most vulnerable 
for sexual exploitation and GBV, even during um, non-disaster times. They do not have the same protection. And oftentimes when wars like this happen, earthquakes, floods, um, various natural disasters, women specifically are the most vulnerable and affected the most frequently, especially considering the ex sexual exploitation that could happen um, to women faced in these situations. And when you think about women as a general population and then deaf women as an even further oppressed subgroup, it can be very difficult. So what we've been trying to do is educate and teach and teach deaf women to act to protect themselves and be empowered so that they can be able to, when crises like this happen, know what to do and be able to have the resources and have the training for get, getting support. Because oftentimes they don't know where to go for help. And also they need to partner with organizations. There's an organization named Clear Global. And what that organization does is support partnerships um, it was uh, through projects funds and creating some sort of a glossary in order so that we could teach various people sign language, simple sign language and words for protection. So like I was talking about those neighboring countries, Romania, Poland, Ukraine, we able, were able to provide a glossary so that those individuals could kind of communicate with each other. Morocco, um, Haiti, um, Morocco had an earthquake as well as Haiti, and there were a lot of deaf women who were subsequently um, passed away due to some of the, the issues that came up with having the hurricane and the resources that were not provided to them. Um, C-U-R-M, cursed, cursed. Um, that was a very, it was a very difficult when those kind of emergency disasters happen. So there was a lot of research that needs to be done and information that needs provided about what the data sets look like for deaf women when things like this happen. And we need to be able to show this information to make policy and changes so that we can take this to the health departments, we can take this to governments and provide counsel on what what their governments need to do specifically in their regions to help and support deaf women um, and make sure that we have deaf women leaders who can then also take on some of the burden of teaching and training and learning how to empower the deaf, their own deaf communities, their local deaf communities, so that when the natural disasters happen, they are not a vulnerable population, but know exactly where the resources can be and where they can find them. Um, Africa is another place that needs to happen a lot that needs to happen. We need to bring some of this education and training to women in Africa so that we can support each other globally and make sure that everyone is provided the resources and everyone knows their rights and how to protect themselves. It's vitally important. So especially how men and other individuals see us today. I think that what we need to do is really invest in women and invest in women leaders so that we can then in turn make sure that they are represented in the data, make sure that when emergencies happen, there is help not just for the men who have historically been participants in surveys such as this and historically been the only people represented in accurate data, but we need to make sure that women are also participatory in this and invest in deaf women leaders so that they can be the ones to empower their communities in ways that would really cause positive change. We need to go to the local areas and in um, and get involved in the language and the culture and figure out what the sign language they're using is, making sure that we're on, um, making sure we know also the spoken language that they're using and how then the sign language is built off of that so that we can really study the wholeness of what it means to be a deaf woman within some of these more rural countries. Sign language is different in various countries, and I think it's really important that we value the language that they're coming from, and we need to take responsibility and co-responsibility for making deaf justice um, for women. I think at this point, we're not quite there yet. And so I think for now, um, we just really wanna make sure that there is justice around the world, especially for deaf women. So I really appreciate and thank you for um, listening to me. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Pamela. And, and thank you to our interpreter. You did an amazing job. We appreciate you. Um, and now we will move on. I want to make sure that we have time for our two remaining panelists. So we'll move on to Katya. And if you will say a few words about yourself and the work that you're doing in Mexico. Thank you so much. Sure. Hello. Good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Katia D'Artigues. I'm a 51-year-old woman who has brown, long brown hair, red glasses. And today I'm, I'm wearing a blouse with flowers of different colors, very Mexican. Uh, my current job would could not be understood without the birth of my son, Alan, who is almost um, 18 years um, old, will be in August. She, he was born with Down syndrome and it changed my life like any mother but his disability changed my priorities. I also realized already in activism that I live with a psychosocial disability myself and due to cultural discrimination and capacitism, even though I advocated for diversity and inclusion, even before Alan was born, I was reticent or unable to see and comprehend myself in that light. I left or rather changed a very successful career as a political columnist and host of political television programs to dedicate myself to activism, to advance the agenda of the rights with people with disabilities. So that's about me. What happened in Mexico? Last October, a hurricane hit the state of Guerrero in Mexico. It was a category five hurricane that caused more than 200,000 homes destroyed. 700 hotels and condominiums affected, uh, 120 hospital and clinics. Uh, in Acapulco, there are 155,370 people living with disabilities. Guerrero is one of the poorest states in our country. Paradoxically, very famous because Acapulco, you know, Acapulco is a very beautiful uh, a beach no, is located there uh, in an Otis, a hurricane devastated much of this Acapulco, which in turn is the city that generates 80% of this state's income. So it was a disaster all around. Yo Tambien, that's the, the organization I lead, is a civil society organization that uses communication as an instrument to advance the agenda of the rights of people with disabilities. And we are a part of the humanitarian support network for people with disabilities that was just created for this emergency. It is made up of more than 20, uh, 20 organizations and experts in the area of disability. At Yo Tambien, we made 12 one hour long accessible transmissions called SOS Discapacidad Otis, that means SOS this Otis Disability, with interpreters in Mexican Sign Language, with the simplest possible language, and also with subtitles. We managed to get several other local media to join our live broadcasts and take up the figures and needs that we made visible. The exclusion of the deaf community, of course, uh, of women with disabilities and also of mothers who cared for people with disabilities and who could not leave their homes to seek support, for example. It was very difficult because the internet, the telephone and the electric networks were also down or the electric network would be up but not the internet, the internet up but not the electrical. We interviewed politicians, teachers, people with disabilities, of course. We, we transmitted what were the needs of people with disabilities and where, and also the specific needs for that population in disaster issues, not just wheelchairs, uh, but adult diapers, for example, or high protein liquid food. We created a specialized supply centers and got other people also with disabilities. That was a great picture to deliver those supplies with the support of other organizations that work in the area. Uh, to date, we are not so clear about the numbers of people affected, let alone people with disabilities. And we are currently advocating for inclusive reconstruction. 
something that everyone says, yes, of course, we, we should do that, no? Whether they will provide the necessary budget to make it a reality remains to be seen. What happened in Acapulco and will continue to happen in Mexican disasters, I'm very sorry to say, was and will be the chronicle of an announced disaster and criminal negligence. The Committee on the Rights of the People with Disabilities that we make part of, of it because of the CRPD, since 2014, issued recommendations to our country on the subject and warn us about the need to prepare ourselves regarding disability. Points that, by the way, were reiterated only in March of last year, 2000. No, not last year, in 2022. My experience has been one of constant indignation on one hand, and also of the enormous, on enormous possibilities that communication and explanation can provide. When in the Humanitarian Network for Disability Assistance in Guerrero, we had, we had clear figures like gatherers nah, that, that people with disabilities have many great dangers in times of disaster of being hurt or dead. Everyone understood it. And in one way or another, they wanted to support. Uh, very by little, little by little, we are evangelizing, gospeling, no? so to speak, about the perspective of disability in all situations of life, life that includes, of course, emergency. What bothers me most is the attitude of the governments, not just the federal government, the central government that is so strong in Mexico today because of the presidency of Andres Manuel López Obrador, but also the local governments that do not fulfill their obligation to inform all people with and without disabilities in an accessible way, even on social networks. I, Mexican uh, sign language interpreters are nowhere to be seen. Uh, in my experience, what works more is telling personal stories. Finally, telling stories, storytelling is very powerful. Everyone is attracted to them. Um, I am inspired uh, by the stories of other women who do so much. The, the annoying one. The yes, the, the women who are labeled like annoying, no, the ones who cause problems, good problems, no, because they refuse to shut up. And, and my recommendation in this day will be that do not shut up. I know that living with a disability is very difficult in many countries, such as Mexico, another who had very poor population. In many times, it's like climbing the Everest in flip-flops. <laughs> but as I constantly say in my talks with people with disabilities and mother, mothers and oh, caregivers of people with disabilities, si no te quejas, no te quejes. If you don't complain, then don't complain. And also I was very touched by Visala. He, she made a very compelling case about it. Please take care of yourself. I love that quote on Maya Angelou. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. And we are not going to have time for Q&A um, and a couple of the other things we were going to talk about today, but that's okay. Um, it has been such a pleasure listening to all of you. And um, just wanna um, thank you all so much for your leadership before I turn it over to Cecilia our intern who's working with Gadra from the World Institute on Disability. Cecilia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Noam. Okay, I will make it. So I do have a background in technology and I would like to thank my brother. And while yes, we, can, there, we cannot hear you, Cecilia. Yeah. We're having a little trouble with your video. I mean, your audio. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. So, as I said, my name is Cecilia, and I'm originally from Tanzania, but I'm currently based in Israel while interning with Gadra, 
with disaster management. So I do have a background in psychology, which I thank Jesus that I was able to do it back in Cyprus. And during my four year period, I was able to volunteer with various organizations and NGOs, which include Caritas and also Hope for Children. And what I noticed then was that although our beneficiaries were asylum seekers, refugees, and human traffic victims, but the disability inclusion was a silent notion in the sense that we lacked the ample knowledge about them. So I remember we had situations where we would have beneficiaries who were disabled who walk into the office and we didn't even know what we we're going to do or what we we're going to, how we were going to help. Them. And I remember I was actually volunteering pre and post COVID and these were extreme times. And the beneficiaries would actually need just like basic needs, like maybe a labor card, which has the disability card on it so that they will be exempted from the strenuous blue collar jobs, which they are, these are the only jobs which they're allowed to work because of their status. But because of the process being very strenuous and the bureaucratic, and also you also need connections, it was so difficult for them to acquire this card. So most of them were forced to work under favorable conditions. And these conditions itself were so difficult for people who were not disabled. So I could imagine how difficult it was for those who were disabled. So regardless of this, although I noticed these hurdles that were happening, I didn't fully understand or conceptualize how intense it was and how their needs was until I interned with Gadra, which was just a couple of months ago in January. And I'm grateful to my lovely team that is Dawn and Christina and others who are working in Gadra where I'm able to, cons they were able to navigate me through the disability culture and etiquette and equity that I had no idea about. So I started going through information from the website and also sit through some webinars in which they were talking about disaster management for disability people. And I realized that there were so many things that I was not able to understand or even fully conceptualize. Like I've been in Israel since October 8, and we understand the whole situation that is happening in Israel with Gaza. That's when I recalled that when the sirens were on, it was so difficult for people who were disabled to actually rush to the shelters. Mind you, the shelters that we have at the hostel, they only have staircases. So we do not have planks. We do not have the tactile pavements where people who are di with different hearing disabilities or people who are blind could actually move. And also the times where we were rushing hysterically down to the shelters, there was no guidance for those people who are disabled or students to guide them to the shelters. So that was a problem for me. And I was like, okay, now what should we do? Something has to be done. Now, that's among the very many problems that I noticed being here. And it's only because I was interning with Gadra. Now, interning with Gadra, regardless, has several parts. This includes that it may be noticed that the university that I'm studying, which is Tel Aviv University, it does do character to the disabled students and provide accessibilities like the tactile pavements that I was talking about. Mind you, although I have a background in psychology, one would expect that I know a lot, but no, I was fully unaware of the different disability spectrum presented because back in Cyprus, the only thing that was ever covered was the cognitive, motor and special aspects in children and people with neurodiversity. And it was often rushed through. So I was not able to fully conceptualize the different spectrum of disability. And with Gadra now, I am confident enough to approach people who are disabled. And I would give like a small notion of a month ago when I was doing my exams, I remember I was coming from my exam and I was heading back home and I stumbled upon a student who is disabled. And I remind you, before I wouldn't actually approach them, but because of the guidance that I got from Gadra and all the notes that I've been reading, they actually gave me the confidence to actually walk towards them and ask them exactly, could I help you in a tone that is understandable? Because if it wasn't for Gadra, I would probably just ignore them, like every other students who were around the person. So I went and I said, can I help you? And I gave my elbow and the person was kind enough to say, yes, I need help. And I was, I was able to guide the person to their building. So Gadra, in a sense, provided me the confidence that I needed to do this. Now, a little bit about what I'm studying. I'm pursuing my master's in disaster management and disaster management usually covers four phases. So we have the preparedness, the mitigation, the response and the recovery. So, and we cater for the catastrophic situations. 
now that I am interning with Gadro, which is almost for three months now, I'm looking forward to working with Gadro and seeing how we could actually provide the necessary humanitarian aid during all these four process, uh, phases, especially the recovery one, which is the most crucial one. And we have to keep in mind that according to WHO with their database, 2023, we have approximately 1.6 billion people who are facing different sorts of disabilities and which covers 16% of the whole population. So my question is, although the population is alarming, why are we still lacking the resources and the knowledge on helping them, which is very sad. So me working with Gadra, I've been able to do a lot of case management and I also presented with organizations which are need assistance and vir in various disasters like the, Tur the earthquake in Turkey. And mind you, these phases are usually long and disabled people are the most vulnerable, they actually face a risk twice as much as a normal person. Another thing that I'm really passionate about is raising awareness to people on disability inclusion. And that's not only just in my country, Tanzania or Israel, but around the world. And also providing intersectionality, because when we talk about intersectionality, we only talk about people who are able and we kind of disregard the marginalized community in a sense, we also disable people. So I'm looking forward to having things like this be taught in our curriculum, because although I'm studying disaster management, we only have one topic in particular that covers disaster, uh, disasters A for disabled people. And our lecture actually told us that this was a new topic that was added this year. So previous years, we had nothing and it's only one topic. So with that one topic, we're not able to fully conceptualize how disabled people really need our help and humanitarian, how do humanitarian aid covers for the disabled people. So I'm looking forward to having, uh, to working with Gadra and also finding ways where we could incorporate either policies or we could actually change the laws and we could have curriculums where we incorporate all of the studies because where I come from in Tanzania, it's even worse because we don't even have the tactile pavements. We don't even have resources that are gonna help disabled people. And right now with all the disasters that are happening in Libya, Morocco and other countries, also in Tanzania, we face a lot of cholera outbreaks, but disabled people are usually the last that people actually regard. And also because that it requires a lot of funds and people don't even know how to navigate, it would be really good if we knew exactly what disaster is and also how we could actually help people in disaster. So this is just the part of what I wanted to talk about. And to end, I would like to wish everybody a happy International Women's Day and may this day transcend more than just the 8th of March. Thank you so much, Cecilia. We're so excited to be working with you at Gadra and really appreciate your words, your dedication. And thank you to all of you. You're amazing leaders and so inspiring in sharing your experiences. We appreciate you so much. And, and just say, I want to say, fight on, lead on, and continue with your amazing advocacy and work. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dawn to close us out. We are um, over time, but I, I appreciate everyone for staying. And I wanted to say an enormous thank you to all of our panelists who brought some incredible value and wisdom um, to us today. And um, to close with uh, quoting Cecilia that, I hope what happens here today um, will continue uh, for the other 364 days. And from Gadra as a whole, as a, an alliance of disability-led organizations, I wanted to thank you for joining. And I hope that we continue these conversations in the days, months, and years to come. Thank you so much. If and all the panelists would still please stay on afterwards.